Anyway, for those listening on YouTube, if you want other uh, stuff here, just go to patreon.com here, as you see, and we're going to continue. Hebrews 13, um, verse 5, we talked about kind of before, uh, Logan filled in, thank you for doing that last week, and then this time, uh, I just want you to get the context of chapter five or verse 5 in what we're going to touch on with verse 6 and 7. So it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And that context was this, is that what was the cure for covetousness? It's in that word for. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And what Hebrews is doing here is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, taking you back to Torah, to the law of God, as Hebrews is constantly doing, but oftentimes we don't realize that's what he's doing because he doesn't say, well, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, they just quote it, okay? So um, that was the cure. Well, he's going to continue on now, and he's going to continue to quote the Old Testament by saying, so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Now he's quoting Psalm 118, verse 6. And he says, I will not fear what can man do to me. There are so many verses that we could look at here that deal with fear and how we're not to fear. Um, Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord keeps you from doing evil. And Jamie Walden, in his message, was talking about, he did a Focus on the Family AFR radio program, and they asked him, what's the you know, biggest problem in the church that you see today? And he said, hands down, the fear of the Lord. We don't have it. We don't fear God. And they're like, well, uh, you, you mean revere, respect, right? He said, no, fear. We don't fear God. Yeah, it was a case in point. And so they kind of beat around the bush a little bit and said, let's move on. Uh, because it has been removed from the churches. And I have found even while doing these Seder meals this week uh, that in saying some things, I did have a couple of people different times come up and talk to me and kind of say, when I would say the law is good, they would say, yeah, but, but there's some right that, that we don't do, right? right? And I'm like, no, you, you will do it. I believe you will keep all of that law outside of the sacrificial law. Jesus did that, but you're going to do it. We may not do it now, but I believe that when the Lord comes back, you're going to do it. And the reason we don't do what we're supposed to do today is just like what Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord keeps one from doing evil. We don't have a fear of God. And not to give Jamie Walden's whole message, but bottom line is he said, you know, fear is what motivated us to do good and to do right all throughout the Marines and whatnot. When you're in Afghanistan, your head's on a swivel. Why? Because you know your fear. You're, you've got both hands on your gun. Because why? Fear. You're, you have fear of your commander, not to let him down. Fear of letting your other teammates and, and, and you know, uh, brothers down. That you, know, you could be the cause of their demise. Fear kept us from doing all these things. Uh, even as a child, fear... And I was thinking about that, you know, a healthy respect of my father. It wasn't just respecting him. It was fear. A good fear. Because I knew that if I got out of line, I could get a SWAT. I could get grounded. I could get whatever. I mean, there was a fear of punishment that went along with my respect and reverence of my father. Never doubted his love for me once. Not once. And so we've lost that. And so the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? What's amazing about this is let's look at some people because I remember I was, as I was going through this, I was remembering our conversation with my wife here months ago when we were talking about some things in Hebrews chapter 11 and how we should not fear. And you said something like, uh, that's easy for you to say, but, you know, I'm scared. And I said well, then your focus isn't where it's supposed to be. And there was more feedback of, yeah, it's easier for you men, blah, blah, blah. And I, I kind of kept saying, no, 
It's, there's something wrong with us if we fear. And I still stand by that. I'm going to explain it a little bit. It doesn't mean you won't fear. As a matter of fact, I expect us all, myself included, to have fear. It doesn't change the fact, though, that there's something wrong with me. Because the Bible says that we do not have a spirit of fear. So when I am living in fear, which I do at times, there is something where my spirit is not connected to his spirit. I am living in the flesh in some way. I am not focused like I should be. Now with that said, you would think, well then people like David would have this down. Paul would have this down, right? When I'm talking about not having fear, I'm not saying you're not a good Christian if you have fear. I'm saying you're normal if you have fear. But look at David here. Okay, this is the David who had a heart after God who clearly was a man of faith. He said, Give ear to my prayer, O God, and do not hide yourself from my supplication. Attend to me and hear me. I am restless in my complaint and moan noisily because of the voice of the enemy. Notice that. It's because of the voice of the enemy. David recognized where the fear was coming from. It isn't because of the Spirit of God, but the fear or the voice of the enemy. Because of the oppression of the wicked, for they bring down trouble upon me, and in wrath they hate me. My heart is severely pained within me, and the terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling have come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. So I'm not saying that you need to feel guilty because you have fear. What I'm saying is, is this is a lifelong battle that no matter how strong we are in our faith, it's a daily thing that we have to face, resist, and fight against. We do not have a spirit of fear. What is the spirit of fear? Satan. And Satan is going to use that fear of the unknown, whether it be your finances, whether it be being alone, whether it be um, you know, an uncertainty of your future. I mean, it doesn't matter. And Jamie Walden, he kind of talked about love. He says, some of you might try and say, well, love motivates me to do these things. He says, but if you're really honest with yourself, probably not. It, it's probably more of a, a fear of rejection, um, a fear of how you will be looked upon. There's some selfish reason between, he says, if you really dig deep, he says, fear is the primary motivator for just about everything that is done. And I, I would agree. But advertising companies know that quite well. Like you said, this vehicle, hey, it's safer for your kids. Uh, you better wear a mask because, you know, uh, you're going to die. So here is David, just such a godly man. Check out him here again. He says in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 11, The servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing of him to one another in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands? Now David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. This is the David that went up against lions, bears, and Goliath with a sling and no armor. And now this king of Achish is making him tremble in his boots? See, it isn't because... David is such a great mighty man as much as it is, where are we at this moment in trusting the Lord? This is a moment where he was living in the flesh, not in the spirit. And we all have those times. It's natural. The question is, what do we do about it when that happens? Now, before we go and look at that, let's look at a couple more examples real quick. Uh, Jacob. Okay, Jacob had all these promises of God. God was going to be with him. Um, he's seen God deliver him many times, and then he's about to go meet his brother Esau. Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. Divided the people and, that were with him, and the flocks and herds and camels and two companies. It seems that he was doing all these things to try and be wise in the ways of the world to protect himself against Esau. But he was greatly distressed. 
the man who had just wrestled with God and was blessed by him. There's plenty to fear in the flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5 says this, For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. This is Paul. Paul, who, man, I'm telling you what, he's the guy that I would just think had no fear. And I was always... Nathan would go out and evangelize with us out on the street all the time. And there were times I was fearful. And I always took courage and strength in Paul because Paul even said, I came to you with fear and trembling. And I thought, well, if Paul did it, that is Satan's number one thing to keep us from evangelizing is fear. For sure. And I remember a couple of nights where my knees were literally knocking. So, it is something that, how fear works. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. So if you are in fear, it is not God's spirit that you are living and walking in at that moment. I don't think fear, having fear is sinful. Maybe what we do with it. I'm going to kind of go to that verse where it says sin when it gives birth or desire uh, when it is conceived gives birth to, to sin and sin when it is full grown gives birth to death basically. That when there's a thought in your mind, I don't think that it's necessarily a sin. It's what you do with that thought when you run with it when it becomes the sin. I think the same is with fear. And I think that is how Satan works. In Romans, it talks about us. It says that we, the, the, the members of my body, wage war against the law of my mind. Why does your body wage war against your mind? Because Colossians says we, has, we have the mind of Christ. Our body, the flesh, is not the holy part of us. The holy part of us is our spirit. And so our spirit is at war with our flesh, you might say. And so I've always looked at it this way, that when Satan puts a thought in your mind, or a, either that thought is there, that's all in the flesh. And what you choose to do with it, when you take control of it, then it becomes yours. And that's why I say, when you have fear, it isn't that you go, oh, I'm failing. It's you recognize that this is not of God. And you say, wait a minute. This is not of God. I need to get in and with God. Take every thought. Take every thought there you go. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And so it's recognizing when we have those fearful moments, taking them captive, and then filling that void with God's word, his promises, praying out loud, singing songs, uh, over and over and over and over again until it becomes real. So, big difference. And I'll tell you what, guys, I do think that we are not out of the woods here in our country with, with trouble. And plenty of things that will cause us fear that Satan is going to use against us. But, as I said eons ago here, why are we afraid? When God comes to judge, he's judging in our favor. The people who really need to be afraid are those who are under the wrath of God. And so keep those, that truth in mind. Acts 18.9 says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Don't be afraid. Paul needed to be reminded of this too. But speak and do not keep silent. We need to be reminded about that with evangelism. For I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. So don't be afraid. I got this. And I always think of Elisha when all of these people were surrounding Samaria, was it? 
And the servant is just like, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And Elisha says, just calm down. Take a chill pill. Look. Look up in the hills. God opened his eyes. Let him see. And he sees all the chariots that are with him. And they far outnumber those that were against Israel. Okay? So, um, it's basically saying the same thing we read in Hebrews. Don't be afraid. Why? For I'm with you. Hebrews just said that. Don't be afraid. Why? Because I'll never leave you or forsake you. Do not fear. I'm your ever-present help in trouble. Just like the, the cure for covetousness was in that four, it's the same thing here. The cure for fear is in recognize it. For I'll never leave you and forsake you. I'm there. Psalm 56.3 says, Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? That's the answer right there. Whenever I am afraid. Not if, when. And every time. Psalm 23, verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. There's that four again. The cure for fear. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So, remember the promises. And we could give you so many more that are in Scripture. That, like I said, there's 365 times it says, Do not fear in Scripture. I've heard 366. There's even one for the leap year, but... So anyway, lots of them. But let's take this more to an uncomfortable level. Second Chronicles 15.2, we see Azariah is going out to meet Asa here. And he says, uh, Azariah goes out to meet Asa. He said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him. He will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Now we don't talk like that in the church today. But this is scripture. Scripture that has not been made null and void or obsolete. Those ifs are very important sometimes. We've talked in, in this group before about prayer. And people say, you know, I just don't feel like God is answering my prayers or that he's hearing my prayers. And I say, well, maybe he's not. What are you doing in your life? David said that if I held iniquity in my heart, God would not listen to my prayers. Psalm 28, verse 5, 28, verse 9, says, or Proverbs, I mean, 28. It says, if um, anyone turns a deaf ear to God's law, even his prayers are detestable to him. So if God's not listening to your prayers, is it possible that you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing? Because here it says the Lord is with you while you are with him. But today we have this cheap grace attitude in the church that says, well, I'm a Christian. I go to church on Sunday and I pray at night. So now I'm going to go watch my porn. I am going to um, go uh, just, you know, gambling and uh, getting drunk and partying it up with all of my buddies. I'm going to be, you know, living my life for me. But God's still going to be with me. Now, while there may be some truth to that, God still will be with you. I don't, don't question that. But don't expect the blessings of your salvation if that's how you choose to live your life. If you choose to forsake Him, I'm telling you, you're not going to be receiving the blessings of God. Okay? He'll be with you. I believe that. Sometimes fear is a good thing. Like I said with my dad, I feared that if I did wrong, there would be punishment. It is no different with our Heavenly Father. You do wrong, there are consequences to sin. I've always used the example of an umbrella for the law of God. 
God gave you these laws, rules of the house, that if you abide by them, hey, everything's going to be great. But if you step outside of that umbrella, you're going to get wet. Doesn't mean he doesn't love you. But there's no protection in living outside of his, his word. I think this is why we see, you know, in the Matthew 7, those who perform miracles in, in, you know, God's name, and yet he says, depart from me, why? You're a worker of iniquity, you have forsaken me. me. Yeah. So, it is a serious thing to think about. Matthew 10, 28, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I don't know why, but for years I always looked at this verse as, I'm not supposed to fear humans, I fear the devil. That's not, that's the exact opposite of what this is saying. You're not supposed to fear the devil and humans. You're supposed to fear God because it's God who sends you to hell. Another kind of interesting thing that just kind of stuck out at me this week when I was looking at this was, God is not going to just destroy your spirit in hell, but the body as well. A long time ago, I talked about, I, I had a friend named Gene Baldwin back in Oregon, and I always remember him saying this at a Bible study in the morning, that he was a dead people guy. What do you do? A coroner. Uh, funeral director kind of thing too and, and basically he said I've seen guys coming in that got caught in grain augers and you know just absolutely twisted and ripped up to shreds and I thought you know there's nothing in scripture that says that when you go to hell you get new bodies but for us in heaven we get new bodies there will be no tear no sorrow whatever and he says I always wondered if if they, I mean, they don't get new bodies. Now that body obviously is going to be rotted and, you know, what I'm saying, but there's something about throwing the body in hell. That the pain of that body might still stay for an eternity. When Revelation talks about that they were weeping and gnashing of teeth, I always think, I don't know if you've ever seen a dog that has been, you know, hurt really bad, and you go to try and help, and it's, <laughs> you know, it's just, that's what I picture it as. <coughs> the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Guys, that's something to fear. Not hell, but the one who can throw you into hell. That's the holiness of the God we serve. One of the things Jamie Walden had said that I thought, wow, I like that, was God is even jealous of our fear. He says, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear, but he's always talking about the world, the devil. Don't fear, but then he says, fear me. You better fear me. God is a jealous God, which means he's even jealous of our fear. And I thought, wow, that's good. That we should fear God. And even that fear of God, as strange as it sounds, is a form of worship because he's jealous of that fear. So when you see so many people in the church saying that we, it's wrong to give this message that we should fear God. What's wrong is saying that that's wrong. God wants our fear. And just like I said, what he was saying, it's that fear that keeps him safe. It is that fear of punishment, of discipline, that the Bible talks about all throughout. Because, you know, when Jesus says, you know, if you love me, you'll do what I say, we can look at the positive side of that, but what's the opposite side? If you don't do what I say, then what? Well, verse 6, again, just looking at it one more time, just to kind of put this in perspective. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? 
We should boldly say those things. Verse 7 says, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Verse 7 here is taking us at switching themes now. We've got a different topic. Remember those who rule over you. He is not talking about the secular government here. He is talking about church leaders. That is the context here. Who have spoken the word of God to you. That's not the government. So we are dealing with church leaders here. Whose faith follow considering the outcome of their conduct. Now, the death of any ministry, church, family begins when they do not realize this. This is how important this verse is, and the Bible is very clear about this in so many ways. You cannot have a functioning society without an authority. And the devil knows this, which is why he likes to destroy the authority in a church. He's trying to defund the police, because he even knows in society that would be the best thing to cause chaos. He knows the best way to destroy a home is to not allow there to be a head of the house who has authority to take a headship role. And because of that, he's going to go after the authority. You go after the kingpin. Because if you can get the head to fall, the body goes with it. Now, it says remember those who rule over you. What, what is that? Just you're supposed to have them in your mind or what? But notice whose faith follows, considering the outcome of their conduct. In other words, these are people who are leading righteously, not those who are leading unrighteously. Deuteronomy 16, 18. I just want to show you that this has been the standard from the beginning. When God created Adam and Eve, he set it up so that there would be an authority, a head over the house. Deuteronomy 16, 18 says, You shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates which the Lord your God gives you. Uh, Titus 1.5, for this reason I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city I commanded you. Notice it's plural there. One man is not supposed to be in charge. From the beginning, that's the, the thing that we have set up. In Deuteronomy, judges and officers. So, what I want to show you is another Old Testament example of this because the very first response to revival is to set up the proper order in the church, the home, the ministry, whatever it might be. It is vital to have that because it is not good that man should be alone it is uh, for the lack of counsel, or for the lack of guidance, counsel, uh, how is that word? For the lack of guidance, nations fall. All of these examples that we can give. Second Chronicles 19.4, So Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem, and he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the mountains of Ephraim, and he brought them back to the Lord, God of their fathers. So there's a revival. He's bringing them back to God. He's revealing truth. There's repentance that is coming. And then it says, Then he set judges in the land throughout all the fortified cities of Judah. One of the first things that he does in order to maintain order within the body of Christ is to appoint judges. 
Not just any judge, but as we see in other parts of Scripture too, these have to be men who by their work you see that they are righteously leading. That there are standards for them. And it goes on and it says, He said to the judges, Take heed to what you are doing, for you do not judge for man, but for the Lord who is with you in the judgment. We can look at Deuteronomy 25.1. If there is a dispute between men and they come to court, that the judges may judge them, and they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. That there's a standard, and they do it by the word of God. I was thinking about that this week, driving home today, actually. And as I was thinking about it, one of my readings was uh, in Chronicles, and we see that Josiah becomes king. When Josiah is king, um, one of the priests finds the uh, book of the law, and they bring it to Josiah, and Josiah tears his clothes. Actually, am I think, now I think it might be Hezekiah. Either Hezekiah or Josiah. I think I'm thinking of this one, Hezekiah. Yeah. But anyway, one of them, he tears his clothes, and the first thing they go do then is they're repenting, and then they send it out throughout the nation so that the people can learn what they're supposed to do, and they repent because, and it basically says, because we have not been doing what God's word said. That's why they repented. And part of me, because of, I think, the, the Seder meals I've been doing this week, and I'm seeing, uh, the thing that I keep drilling into everybody this week is this. How come we keep hearing that this is a festival for the Jews? This isn't for the church, it's for the Jews. And by the time I'm done, they go, oh, I guess it is for us. And it, it made me think of that, that it's like, Okay, the book of the law has been found. We have opened it up. We have shared this to you that you've been doing something wrong in the churches. You've been misled. What are you going to do about it? And typically the answer is nothing. We need righteous leaders to be standing up because the very first thing that needs to happen in revival is this. Judges need to be appointed and we need to be saying, this is the word of God and we're going to follow it because we fear God more than we fear man. There needs to be an authority, but we have to use God's word as our measure of what truth is. Titus 1.9 says, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. And as a leader of a Bible study, I would be um, bad, what's the word? Remiss. Remiss if I didn't hold your feet to the fire of what the scriptures say, at what point do we say, it doesn't matter what I think, what I want, what I desire, what matters is sound doctrine, that I do what God's word says, regardless of my upbringing. Imagine those Israelites who their entire life, all they knew, and now God is just saying, no, you're doing it this way. It's no different. Imagine this Josiah or Hezekiah, whoever that was, now that I can't seem to pull together. Okay, so remember Josiah, his entire life, for the last 60 years or longer than that. That couldn't have been Josiah. He died at like a really young age. But the people. All these people, they all, all they knew was really pagan worship. And now this king comes in and says because he's going to be a judge. He's going to take authority. And he says, this is wrong. Look, we've got the word of God. 
here it is, we're going to do this. Do, do you think everybody, okay, he said, all right, we're going to do it. Or do you think there was a lot of gossip going around in the home saying, can you believe what he's doing? You know, he tore down those, those things, you know, the, the chariots that Hezekiah, uh, whoever it was who built them, he's doing this, he's tearing down all these altars, he's doing all this stuff. My question to you is, are you willing to give up everything that you hold dear to follow God in his word without justification? All of us have to answer that question. There's all kinds of things in our life besides holidays that we hold dear that we don't want to get rid of. It could be something as simple as what we watch on TV. Or that. You want to hit all the really tough ones tonight. Okay. I, I, I'm talking about the simple things. The, the, who we hang out with. What we're watching on TV, what you listen to on the radio, um, the language you use around your coworkers. It doesn't matter what it is. We all have to ask ourselves, are we willing to give it all up to follow the word of God? So, when Solomon dedicates a temple, they build an altar. That altar was about 30 feet long this altar, where you have the uh, three cows, three bulls on each side, huge. But as he dedicates it, he sticks another, he builds another bronze altar in front of it. And it tells how big it is. It is the exact dimension of the altar in the tabernacle, which was much smaller, which also was covered in bronze. And Solomon gets up and he stands on that altar. And he raises his hands to the heavens, and he begins to pray to God, that great prayer of the dedication. Now, two things. First of all, I find that amazing because this is kind of what Romans says, that we are to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, for this is our spiritual act of worship. There's a picture of Solomon, who is a Christ figure, which I won't get into all of that now, but he is a very clear Christ figure, standing on that altar that was where the sacrifices would be made. That's interesting. So it's a picture of you know Yeshua coming, but it's also that picture of us offering ourselves as living sacrifices. And then finally, what he said was this. You know, we often hear, you know, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and whatnot. Well, when he's talking about this, he says, if... When you allow them to, I don't remember how it's worded exactly, but to be attacked and have trouble in their life, and then they turn to you, hear their prayer and heal them. The part that I never really noticed was that first part. When you allow trouble to come into their life, basically, then they will seek you and then they will be healed. So to answer your question, yes, I think so, but I think it's when trouble's going to come. And we're going to, I think it's going to turn our world upside down. And you know what else I find interesting is, I've talked many times about the hypocrisy in the churches today. Why do you think that hypocrisy is there? Because we've sold out. We don't have the standard of sound doctrine anymore. And so now we all get to do well, I see fit. This is what happened in the book of Judges when they don't have judges, when they don't have elders, when they don't have people that are authorities to tell them what to do, which is what's happened in the churches. We all decide what, well, I think this and I think that. Our Bible studies are filled with questions. How does this make you feel? What do you think about this or that? Who cares what you think? Okay. What we see here in, in the book of Judges, the very last verse says, when they had no king to tell them what to do, they all did what was right in their own eyes. That's us. When are we going to stop? That's the question. And so the commission given here to judges, to elders, is this. You are not to judge by emotions, by culture, by your own desires, but you judge by the word of God, sound doctrine. Because that's the only place doctrine comes from, 
is by God's word. Well, I better continue here if we're going to wrap this up. 2 Corinthians 10.8, For even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed. In other words, judges, elders, pastors, leaders of any sort, a husband in your home, why are you given the authority to rule? For the edification of others. Not to be a dictator for your own desires, but for the edification of others, to help them. That's the reason you're there. And I see a lot of people who want to be in authority in many different ways so that their agenda can be accomplished. That should never be. It should always be. Well, it, a good secular picture of that is when we elect a senator or whatever, they are supposed to be a representative of the people. That's the way the biblical model is supposed to be too. A pastor, a, 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 a Bible study leader, we are to be a representation or a representative for you but with the fence of sound doctrine and God's word, not for selfish reasons. 1 Timothy 5.17, Let the elders, again plural, who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Not because they're just good, nice Christians, but because they labor in the word and in doctrine. Meaning, not just reading your Bible, but doing what it says. Holding to that. Proverbs eleven fourteen, where there is no counsel, the people fail or fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So, again, this is crucial for a church. Crucial for even in a secular world, it's crucial for a business to really, I think, be that way. So, um, Hebrews 13, verse 7, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you. When we go back and look at this then, taking all that we've talked about, put that into this verse. Okay, remember those. That pray for them. They are there for your edification and they're there to give you sound doctrine and word, the word of God. Um, and their fruit, by their fruit you will know them, their conduct, you might say. Judges 5.2, I'll end on this one. When leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. In other words, when you have good authority, the people are under that authority, it's a blessing. And Satan cannot come against that. It's when you lose that structure and that foundation that Satan can attack. So, very, very important. And God's Word is filled with that, which, by the way, is also why, if you recall in the book of Acts, when the whole question of... Um, the Gentiles coming into the church, and should they be circumcised or not, what's the first thing they do? They go to the elders. They go because there needs to be a decision made. Okay? They didn't, one guy didn't, Paul, Paul didn't do anything, Peter didn't do it. They go and they have a discussion, and it's the word of God that makes the decision under the Nasi or the ruler of James, it seems, the, who has the final authority, the final say, it said. So, all right, well, we'll pray. Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful that you are our head, our authority. And Lord, I know that um, you work despite me, that's for sure. I mess up all the time. I have failed over and over and over again. And for that, I am just so grateful for your forgiveness. 
I am thankful that there is no condemnation because I have been forgiven. That your word would continue to teach us, Lord, and all of us have things in our life that we hang on to, but I just ask that you would allow us to let that, that clenched fish, or fin, fist just be released, that we would not hang on to those things, but that we would give them to you and let you be the one who leads, let you be the one who directs every step, that your word would be a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, and that you would be gentle with us in the meantime while we in our stubbornness and in our flesh continue to flail around a little bit. So be gentle, but Lord, don't ever let us be comfortable in our flesh. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus, we pray. Amen.